So uh, my name is Scott Kerr, Executive Director of Strategy and Insights at Time Inc. And as we said, the, today we're going to talk about virtual reality and augmented reality through mobile revenue driver or FAD. I can tell you right now, it's not a FAD. Otherwise, there will be millions of dollars being lost as we speak. But um, we've assembled this terrific panel here to talk about AR and VR. And unless you've just w awoken from a cryogenic freeze, you know that AR and VR is the hottest technology out there. Every day you look online, someone's talking about a big investment they're making in augmented reality or virtual reality. New headsets are being launched every single day. It really is the talk of the town when it comes to technology. So this panel right here is going to really dissect what's going on in AR and VR, talk about where the money is being made at the end of the day, because that's really important here. So I'll introduce them. To my left, we have Mia Trams, the managing editor of Life VR and senior multimedia editor at Time Inc. and my colleague at Time Inc. Uh, Kalish Kumar, director of product management at Adobe. And Logan Mulvey, vice president of content at Striver Labs. And last, we have Michael Schmier, VP Content and Services, Samsung Electronics America, and leading the Samsung's efforts when it comes to the virtual reality experience. So welcome, everybody. So Thank I want to you. kick things off right now by sort of setting the table here of what's going on out there, because a lot of people here could, might not be familiar with what's the difference between virtual reality and augmented reality. You hear about all these different hardware and headsets. So Mia, maybe you could help everybody out and let us know what's going on out there in the landscape. If you could share with everybody, you hear things like the uh, HTC Vive and the Samsung Gear VR and Oculus. What, what is the difference and who, what, is, what, are, what are the players out there right now? Sure, um, so uh, I'd just like to see a show of hands. How many people in the audience have watched VR? Oh wow, almost wow, all of lot. you, great. How many people have watched on a cardboard headset? How many people have watched on a Samsung Gear headset? How many have watched on an Oculus headset? And how many people have watched on a Vive? Wow, a lot. Interesting. Wow. OK, so I won't spend too much time talking about cardboard. It seems like you guys all know what that is. Um, and it seems like you're all very familiar with the Samsung Gear as well. Um, for those of you who are not as familiar with the Oculus and HTC Vive headsets, they're certainly um, the most top of the line experiences. Um, the Samsung Gear headset was created as a collaboration with Oculus. Am I getting that right? Um, you are. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so the, I'll back up a little bit. The Gear and the Cardboard, of course, as most of you know and have experienced, offer a 360 experience. You are, um, as the viewer, you're at a central point. Uh, you're looking at stuff that's happening all around you, but you can't walk into the experience necessarily. You do have a limited amount of interactivity, um, especially more on the gear headset. Uh, but for the most part, it's a passive voyeuristic experience, and you're, you're watching 360 content. On the Oculus headset um, and on the Vive, you have the addition of sensors outside of the headsets um, that tell the headset where you are in the experience. And uh, it's a bit more of an immersive experience all around. Um, with the Oculus headset, you can use a controller to play video games in, in the headset as well. Um, and with the Vive, um, they have what's called a room scale experience. So for those of you who haven't experienced it, you can actually walk into um, what they call the play area. It's a designated area that you would set up in your living room or you know, a space that you've installed the headset into. And you can walk through the experience and uh, use the two hand controllers that come with it to uh, kind of um, interact with things that are happening around you. So you can play full on video games, you can paint. There's a really cool program called Google Tilt Brush um, that Google made uh, where you can paint in 4D. Other than that, uh, something of note is, uh, of course, the PlayStation headset that's coming out this fall. Um, it's called Project Morpheus. They'll be releasing it um, uh, as uh, something that works with existing PlayStation consoles. So if you buy the headset, you plug the headset into the console, and you're ready to watch VR. Um, there's many other uh, headsets launching almost daily now. Um, they all have their own different bells and whistles and um, you know unique features. But those are, I think those are the ones to be most aware of, and certainly the ones that um, 
most people are publishing towards currently. Yeah, I think the Samsung Gear just updated their Gear VR, right, Michael? Yeah, we just uh, released our latest version of uh, Gear VR a couple months ago. And what is the difference? What is the update? So, so the main difference is um, we, uh, so a couple different things. Uh, first of all, trying to make it uh, lighter, uh, increasing uh, the field of view um, so that there's a wider perspective. Um, there's a new type of USB uh, input um, into the headset, so um, that allows third-party developers to not only create apps, but also to uh, add hardware peripherals. So you could imagine adding, for example, position and hand tracking peripherals actually to the to the Gear VR um, headset. And just to just to add on here, I think one of the most fascinating things early on in this market is really, especially when you're thinking about monetizing and where the money is, is really thinking through the use cases and what is tethered, what's appropriate for tethered, meaning you're going to be stationary, but it's going to have higher fidelity and have uh, more capabilities like position tracking versus mobile VR which is going to have less bells and whistles, but is going to be way more uh, mass market in the, right. in the short term. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so that's always an important consideration on the monetization side. Absolutely. So I don't know, about 16 months ago, if we were sitting at the same spot 16 months ago, all the analysts were saying that 2015 was going to, 2015 was going to be the year of VR. Fast forward 16 months or so, what has happened over the last 12 to 15 months in this industry that you have seen, that you're personally excited about? And on top of that, what are the, over the next 12 months are you looking forward to? So, Logan? Yeah, that's, I think things have changed tremendously every day, like, like the rest of the panelists have mentioned. I think I'm excited about companies like Samsung and Google that are willing to put as many headsets into the marketplace as possible. I think that's what's going to take this from a fad to something that's very real and adopted by mainstream. I think we can all agree that the gamers are going to get involved and they are getting involved and they will buy the headsets with the head tracking. But to take it to the mass markets, it's gonna be companies like Samsung, Google and others that are willing to uh, lose money, give them away, whatever they have to do to make sure that people have uh, a way to view the content. What do you see in the next 12 months that uh, you're really excited about? I really like the HTC Vive and some of the things that they're doing and, and the things that they're pushing. Some of the games that are going to come out uh, on the Vive and for PlayStation, I think are going to be a lot of fun for people that are maybe just a casual or less than casual gamer. Um, I think we'll see some great sports. Uh, we'll see some first person stuff that'll be great. What about you, Kalish? So if you break up the VR market into three segments, you've got the gaming, entertainment, and the business applications or enterprise use cases, whatever. Um, I focus, uh, and Adobe primarily has been on the middle section, the uh, entertainment, and primarily content. Um, almost every one of my customers, uh, we're talking to them about VR um, content. So our, my customers, our customers are the likes of uh, uh, TV companies, Fox, HBOs, um, the distributors, Comcast, Time Warner, and um, I, I think every one of them has a very active, uh, very aggressive VR program. So when I look forward to the next 12 months, um, um, I see a lot of live, uh, live content, live sports, um, and episodic content. And uh, you won't see that 360 content, but you'll see the 360 experience with 180 content on it. Um, and the types of things that we are focused on um, to enable is uh, monetization of that. So going beyond the experience and helping um, advertising of that um, experience. Uh, next 12 months, certainly very excited to see the devices. Um, uh, I, I don't think they have to be a loss leader, but it's great if they can be. Um, uh, just seeing a tremendous, a tremendous amounts of uh, uh, investment coming in from the content companies as well. And uh, that's where we're focused on right now. It actually kind of, you know, it's, it's, it kind of feels like the good old days of VR, even though it's just started and you're doing all these exciting things. So uh, it's, a great, it's an exciting time to be around uh, this space. Uh, what about you, Michael? So I think the most exciting thing from my perspective that you're seeing now that you didn't have uh, 18 months ago is a true ecosystem forming. And if you want to know why I don't think this is a fad or it has a chance to succeed, 
um, is the existence of that uh, ecosystem. And Kalash, you mentioned a few of those things. It's every partner we're talking to, it's creators, um, it's brands, and these brands, when we work with brands, it's not about advertising in VR, it's literally how can I use VR in my business to change my, uh, to change my business model, working with uh, technology partners. Um, so we're still in the early stages of that ecosystem development, but from a, from a Samsung perspective, you know, that's what really gets me excited. Um, for the next, for the next 12 months, uh, some of the things that I continue to look forward to are, uh, are the growth in the audience. Um, so the ecosystem needs two things to thrive, it needs distribution. So we have to have more users using it. Um, and you're gonna have to have monetization at, at some point. We're lucky enough that folks like my time colleagues are probably willing to experiment in VR without making a full return on their investment. But they're doing that so that um, long term they believe that um, this will be a monetizable um, asset in addition to being right. able to tell stories in a different way. Of course. Leah, what about you? What are you excited about next 12 months? Um, well, one company I'm really excited about is called Awesome Rocket Ship, and this goes back to the monetization That's question. That's an awesome name. It is an awesome name. <laughs> right. So they're, and you know, I think they're probably the first of what will be many companies that are um, helping on the distribution side of VR. So Awesome Rocket Ship, you can actually, you can look up their website and see what I'm talking about. They, they're making VR view viewports. Um, they're modular. You can have anywhere from one to nine viewing pods in a, in a given port. And um, they'll work with both uh, stand-up and sit-down VR experiences. And what they're doing is they're approaching um, malls, movie theaters, theme parks, and museums um, to install permanently or semi-permanently these viewports and uh, bring some of this content back into the public space. So um, for example, if time created a piece of content, we could create a relationship with Awesome Rocket Ship where we give them that piece of content. They then take it to um, a chain of movie theaters in China, say, uh, install the viewport, and then sell tickets to that experience. So the ticket then becomes a rev share between the content creator, Awesome Rocket Ship, and the venue. And I think, you know, while we are facing hurdles with uh, user adoption in terms of purchasing headsets on their own, it's a great way, one, to distribute the content and monetize it, two, also just to introduce a wider market to VR and create some interest around purchasing a headset, for example. So I think that's, that's something I'm really looking that's forward awesome. to. So you can't talk about 2016 uh, until you talk about the elephant in the room and that, I guess, the Pokemon in the room. <laughs> How many Pokemon players do we have here, Pokemon Go players? How, come on, there's more, are you just afraid? To, are there any good Pokemon Go's? Did you, anybody try it around here? Any good stations? I saw some people walking around before trying to catch some. But um, you really can't, it's amazing what Pokemon Go has done for the whole area of augmented reality. Because before Pokemon Go, mo your average consumer, what they thought of augmented reality, they associated with Google Glass. And we know some of the repercussions that happened there and that what people thought about that. All of a sudden, Ayer was on the map. And it'll be interesting to see where the momentum is. I'm asking the panel here, what do you think Pokemon Go has done for the AR, and even virtual reality for that matter? The fact that I think at, um, at Tim Cook's event this morning, the iPhone event, I think he announced that uh, Pokemon Go, I think, is going to be on the Apple Watch. So uh, stay tuned for that. So anyway, let's talk about Let's talk about uh, Pokemon Go and AR. What, where, what is the future of AR? What has Pokemon Go done for this area, this, this area? Well, I think one thing it's done is, previously, when we thought about AR, we thought about billion-dollar startups investing huge amounts of money in, in original hardware. What this clearly shows you is that there are fundamental use cases using something as simple as your camera on your mo mobile phone, where just taking that camera and imposing algorithms or the intelligence that's already on your phone, adding huge value to the consumer, whether that's from a utility perspective or an entertainment perspective. And so I think what you're gonna see in the AR market is kind of convergence from two ends. You're gonna have like super high-end HoloLens, 
B2B type focused hardware, but you're going to have this, these mass use cases of just using your phone. Imagine, uh, hey, I can put my phone on my menu and look at a menu in a restaurant and all of a sudden all these things pop up like calorie counts and it could integrate into my uh, fitness calculator and all these type things. So I'm really excited about that. So do you think it has, you know, with Pokemon Go, there was a gamification element put into it to make people use it. So I'm wondering, do consumers need this gamification element in order to start using, you know, get gain momentum when it comes to AR? Um, from, from my perspective, not always, right. but the one thing that, you know, we always see in the technology world is a lot of times technology, we're excited about technology, but we really haven't figured out the, the consumer use case. I think that as long, like with a game, gamification is natural. I think there will be other utilities where there's a lot of value add for the consumer. Um, in their in their everyday life to use these things, and I'm not going to have to necessarily give them badges or points for right. those type things. Yeah. Um, but I also believe gamification is is also powerful if you use it in the in the right context. It just depends on your app. Anybody else want to weigh in on AR? Sure. So uh, uh, a couple of things about Pokemon. Um, the day it was launched, it uh, went to the top of the list on the App Store which roughly worldwide is about five million revenue per day, give or take some. Uh, US is probably one and a half to two million. That's unheard of in, in the App Store. Like, that's just unbelievable. Um, Pokemon to me is uh, way beyond AR, uh, what they did. Uh, brilliant marketing uh, leading up to the launch. Um, the app itself uh, is a lot more about the, the group play and the group dynamic um, along with location. I don't see it as, a, as much as a, a victory for AR, uh, as on game design, the use cases, the, the location uh, elements in there, and the social nature of the, of the, of the game. Um, honestly, Snapchat, in some ways, was the first mass market AR, where you put stickers on your faces and all that. Uh, um, so AR has been around. Uh, it will be around uh, things like we just talked about, I, I think will definitely grow. But AR is just a medium rather than a, a, a thing, a strategy itself. Um, it, it's just one of the tools you use to, to make it more engaging. Um, and I think Pokemon itself uh, has shown that, yeah, if you combine a number of elements uh, with the, the game design in mind, you can get great results. Uh, I mean, what, 30 days in, they probably have broken 100 million revenue. I mean, the fastest product in the history of business, or one of the fastest products in the history of business. Um, I don't think it's because of AR, but they leverage AR really well to, yeah. to get the result. So let's talk about the, the hardware you know, po component of that. I think one of you were talking about earlier about um, you know, the Samsung essentially giving away the VR headset for free or really cheap. How important do you think it is for um, you know, smartphone manufacturers, the hardware manufacturers, uh, working with the uh, telecommunications manufacturers and able to subsidize it and give those things away to give the headsets away to consumers to get the you know the mass adoption of this for this category to speed it up. Um, I I actually I would maybe flip that around a little bit. So if you think about uh, video game consoles, those are not cheap. Right. Um, the reason that people buy them is because of the content. They want to play that game. And it's worth the investment for them to pay that much money to be able to play that game at home. So I think it's sort of a, it's a dual question. One is, you know, what sorts of content are going to compel people to buy the hardware? And then does the hardware deliver on the promise? Does it give you the experience that you were seeking? So I think, I think it's both. And um, you know, they both have to justify the purchase. They have to work together to justify the purchase. So I don't think it has to be cheap necessarily. I think that you have to have those two things working in concert that compel a user to buy. So, so content before platform is going to drive people. What do you think, Logan? I, I think I touched on it earlier. I, I, I think it's paramount. And, and we're at a mobile conference, and the, and the mobile manufacturers are, are going to be the ones to really drive this to mass adoption across. China and India and Brazil and all the, the, the BRIC countries, because um, that's where that's where the people are and, and the masses. And if we want to move this in, of course, uh, to Mia's point though, you got to have you got to have content to feed the beast. So I know Samsung is. You know, we're talking about Samsung. What what can you share a little bit more about 
um, what the strategy is when it, that you can share when it comes to getting um, the headsets into the hands of consumers? And what, what the, bigger, the big overall strategy is when it comes to the whole ecosystem when it comes to Samsung and how it fits into that? So, you know, I, I think it's pretty obvious that, um, you know, we're a hardware manufacturer that's also investing in the VR ecosystem platform. Um, and we view, view, view VR as a bigger part of a mobile lifestyle overall. And I think you've seen how our approach to um, VR is really an extension um, of, your, of, your, of your mobile phone. So we, you know, we don't really view VR as a, um, necessarily as a, as a giveaway. We've actually seen um, that uh, we don't have to give it away. Um, for consumers to um, to actually uh, be willing to purchase the, the device, which is a great sign um, for for VR in the in the in the market. Um, but at the at the same time, I think Samsung's approach has always been we're about um, mass consumer technology, and so when we undertake something, our goal is to make sure it's applicable to um, to every household out there. And so I think that's what you'll see our, our, our approach going forward. So the, you know, the obvious use case scenario when it comes to VR is gaming, and that's what's kind of driving it right now. That seems to be getting a lot, a lot of the buzz. But we all know that there's a lot of other use cases for VR, and I'd love to hear from the entire panel some of the things that not only you're involved with when it comes to uh, virtual reality, but other things that you're excited about um, other use cases outside of gaming. So, Mia? Um, well, I will certainly uh, defer to a lot of this to um, Logan over there, because this is, I think, uh, very much part of what his company does. Um, but there, in addition to being a platform for, or a, a medium for gaming and a medium for entertainment, um, virtual reality and AR can both have inherent uh, utility as well. Um, so there's a, there's a lab at Stanford, which uh, Logan is very familiar with, uh, called the Virtual Human Interaction Lab. And it's run by two professors. Uh, one is named Jeremy Balenson, the other is Walter Greenleaf. And they have been um, running this lab for 10 years. They've been working in VR for 10 years at Stanford. Uh, Walter's been working in VR for 30 years. And they create experiences um, that are meant to change human behavior. So they have done things like treat anxiety, depression, chronic pain, PTSD. Um, they do diversity training in VR. Um, they have done uh, environmental awareness training with VR. Um, there's certainly um, you know, a lot of use cases towards helping people um, develop tools that they can then take into their everyday life. Um, one of the pieces that Life VR is launching with that uh, we've created with Walter from uh, VHIL is meant to relax you in under five minutes. Um, it's uh, an interactive piece that uh, you know uh, will also become a part of pre-op procedures at the Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford. Um, and you know it's it's meant to uh, help you practice some of the ten tenets of mindfulness and um, to relax. It's a very light touch of what uh, many other companies are tackling in VR and AR. Uh, uh, there are you know, certainly a bunch of apps out there that you could find right now in the App Store that are guided meditations in VR. Um, there's a company called Muse that makes a headband, um, which is a guided meditation application as well. Um, so you know, I think that uh, if you're talking about improving someone's lifestyle, uh, that's certainly an application for those two mediums, and there's companies out there that have been doing that and are doing that, um, you know, and in in a uh, in many different ways. What about you, Kalish? Um, so, uh, uh, the gaming, entertainment, and the um, the, the business applications, uh, and I would say lifestyle is the fourth one. Um, uh, personally, we're focused on the entertainment, and and this would be live content. Uh, your your uh, TV content. Uh, personally, a very big believer that uh, um, maybe five years from now, uh, a lot more households will be watching in entertainment that way, um, and and that's the that's the path that I see the the headsets and devices going, uh, especially your mobile devices, um, and then things like uh, 
the, the business sector, I mean, the, each industry has really, really interesting application. Real estate, uh, I mean, imagine selling real estate through, through uh, giving the experience to, to, to a buyer through, through that device. Industrial applications. Um, healthcare, uh, my brother-in-law is a doctor. Uh, they're already starting to uh, experiment with how they can use VR for surgery. Uh, where they're not actually using the VR, but, but they're understanding the, the, the procedure much, much better. Um, so, so overall, uh, the reason why I get really excited about VR is because of, of uh, this medium, which is so much more immersive. Uh, uh, yes, you should not have your kids, like, under 13 use this, but I'm, I get my seven-year-old girl, the daughter to uh, put it on and, and play around with some of the apps uh, because I do believe that this immersive experience is going to win the uh, win at the end um, and uh, all along gaming entertainment and, and business lifestyle will, will be uh, leveraging that medium Logan I know uh, Striver is doing some really interesting things when it comes to virtual reality and uh, athletes uh, I would love to share with the audience uh, what your company does and some of the uh, new things you're working on yeah, so, so Striver was really born out of a need. Um, our founder was a football coach at Stanford, and for those of you who are familiar with collegiate sports, there is uh, time limits on how much uh, time a coach and a player can spend together training and learning and understanding. So uh, Derek, our founder, was looking for ways to get his quarterbacks more time on the field without breaking the rules. So he went to the human interaction lab at Stanford and said, hey guys, I have this concept. I think maybe VR uh, will work for this. So Jeremy goes, uh, goes into the lab and comes up with a few different concepts. And one was, was kind of interesting. He said, look, if we come up with a way to totally immerse a player on the field in the same position he would be in uh, during practice, I think there's a way that we can create a software and have them run through all of that day's practice and feel like they're on the field and getting those repetitions and really moving towards the 10,000 hour rule. Uh, and we've seen a, a, a tremendous amount of success. Um, last season, 2015, three of the top six highest rated quarterbacks in college football used Striver every single day. So they were in there looking at defenses understanding plays, trying to find the best pre-snap read. So we've taken this concept and moved it to other sports, right? So we use it for batters, Major League Baseball. They can watch a pitcher a hundred times. They can start to learn the arm angle for a certain pitch, what the trajectory of this certain pitcher's curveball is going to do, right? Things that you can't just stand in the batter's box and do. You have to, you have to watch it in VR over and over and over again to train your brain to make you think that you've been there and you've done that when it when it happens in real life. So we're using we're using this this concept that we came up with and, and moved it across all sports and, and even moved it into into fan engagement, trying to solve issues of people not coming to stadiums, um, trying to improve customer sentiment. Brands are hiring us to build experiences that shed a positive light on their brand. That's great. Michael, what about you? What about some of the new and interesting content outside of gaming that you're seeing for the Gear VR? So um, we are, in addition to mass consumer areas, which I would define as things like, uh, obviously, gaming, entertainment. Um, we haven't even touched social and what that means um, in, uh, in VR. Um, what, we, what we're doing is uh, looking at all the different verticals where we traditionally do business and really thinking through um, what VR means in those verticals. So think about uh, construction industries. Um, imagine that your foreman, um, you and your foreman could walk through a blueprint of something um, before you've built it so that you can actually see exactly the way it's supposed to look in real life versus just in a 2D uh, drawing. And imagine that you're going to then sell, um, before this thing's ever built, sell it to your commercial customer. And you know what your closing pitch is? You're going to put them in a VR headset and walk them through the space. And it's going to be way more real than having them uh, watch a, a 2D video. So you can take that and apply that to commerce. Um, I believe. Uh, I, I believe it's Baidu, for example, already has a uh, e-commerce uh, VR experience. Um, 
hospitality. Um, oh, I go to the hotel room and there's a VR uh, waiting for me and I can put it on and easily see the 10 best. I can learn about the hotel and see the, the 10 best attractions right next to the uh, hotel to check, check out. Travel. Um, hmm, is there an application for VR headsets on airlines? Um, and, and my uh, colleagues up here have obviously mentioned uh, other applications. In some ways, I think B2B has a power to pull through consumer adoption because if you look at most of these use cases, it's not B2B in the sense that, hey, the real use cases I'm going to, there are these use cases. I could put tr go train, could work with this airline company and train um, uh, maintenance people to, to fix the planes using uh, VR. But the real power is having those brands, again, integrate them into the business model um, and get the brands to get consumers to use this. Because the biggest issue we have is the friction of putting on this headset. Um, we're still in the early stages of, of the hardware. Right. There's a lot of friction in, in putting your phone on or, you know, going into your room and putting on a, on a tethered headset. So if we have these real world analogs, like, oh, I'm at a movie theater and there's a, there's a, a, I can see previews right there, or I'm in the classroom and my teacher says, put on a headset, I think that's gonna be huge in a driving uh, adoption for mass adoption VR in early years. Let's talk about making money. <laughs> So there's a lot of great interesting entertainment out there, a lot of new headsets launching. I think they're predicting $330 billion industry by 2020. So what is the path to making money in this business? I'll throw it up to the panel. Who wants to jump in on that one? Who has the secret sauce? Uh, I'll start. So uh, <laughs> uh, first, I'm going to repeat the segments that I had laid out earlier. With gaming, you've got a very clear business model. You've got very, very engaged audiences. Um, you would apply the basic models you have today. No need to change that because that works really well. Either send that purchases or download to own. A um, bunch of experimentations going on uh, with that. On the entertainment side, um, uh, the, the two earlier question actually on AR, uh, we're seeing, well, that's what we're investing in. We, we, we foresee um, a future um, where AR and VR uh, blend together and you've got AR uh, augmenting the VR experience. So advertisements and um, monetization in that. Advertising always follows the audiences. So if there's an audience, they'll be advertising. It's not the other way around. So um, um, we, we, I, I do see entertainment being a very, very big pillar of, uh, of VR. Um, uh, with the mobile devices that we have uh, today, they're way, way stronger, uh, faster than two years ago. Two years from now, guaranteed there'll be a A12 chip uh, on the iPhone, they are, are the next uh, chip on Samsung. There'll be more battery, more everything. That's where VR becomes a lot um, easier. So I do think entertainment will be used and when there are eyeballs there, there'll be advertising models. Um, on the B2B, I mean, that, that's a very clear cut. Uh, in the case of uh, the real estate industry, if that helps sell, um, it, it'll drive uh, just the traditional SaaS models or software sales. Um, and the lifestyle, I don't know. Uh, I'll, I'll ask Mia to talk about some of the lifestyle business models. Um, but basically, audiences and the monetization after that. Uh, gaming, already you're seeing audiences starting to go there. Um, our big bet as Adobe is uh, entertainment audiences will be there, uh, both for live as well as on-demand content. Um, and then on the B2B, that's, that's clear cut. Uh, that's a very good SaaS model. I can say we're, we're making money, so we're, we're solving problems. I think in the short term, if you're solving problems, you will make money on the business to business side. But I, I can't be any more eloquent than what he said earlier. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I agree with what you said. You know, I think it's a it's a first step of developing an audience, and if an audience is there, then an advertiser will want to be there. Um, if you look at the New York Times virtual reality app that they launched, uh, you'll see examples of this. Um, they have uh, native experiences that were created for companies like GE and Mini um, that became sponsors of the app itself. 
Um, cardboard headsets are very brandable, and you know, you, you, I think you'll definitely see, there have been some examples, especially with the New York Times, and will be more examples in the next 12 months of companies shipping um, cardboard headsets flat with things like magazines and newspapers. Um, Coca-Cola just integrated a VR headset into their packaging, so if you bought you know, a 12 pack of Coke in a box, um, you could take the box and turn it into a VR headset. McDonald's did the same thing with the Happy Meal box. Um, so, you know, I think there's a bunch of different ways where if you can attach a, a, a sponsor's brand to um, either a piece of content or to a piece of hardware, um, those are certainly ways to monetize um, VR. I think, you know, there's also uh, the back-end distribution question, which I touched on a bit earlier with a company like Awesome Rocket Chip. Once you've made the content, you know, I think increasingly there will be more ways to distribute it and to make money off of the thing that you've made. And, uh, you know, I expect that will become very interesting in the next 12 months. Yeah. Can so, I add just one, sure. one yeah, quick thing? So I think one common theme here is uh, long-term there's going to be business models, right? There's, there's going to be advertising as we get the audience, or there's going to be the traditional business models. The issue is in the short term as we traverse from no audience to a huge audience. And one theme you're hearing that's critical is think about for VR monetization, rather than as a new business model, how to extend your existing business model. So for example, if you have an advertising business, it's probably not going to work to sell a million dollar sponsorship it, if if it does work this way you guys tell me because I want to know but you know <laughs> it's probably not going to work just to sell a million dollar sponsorship to access a $250,000 audience but let's say you already have uh, a big relationship with um, General Motors. They're already advertising on your properties. There's huge opportunities to um, add value add to that relationship, up the price, close it more quicker, all those type things um, uh, uh, by using VR. And a lot of these companies right now see VR, number one, as a shiny object. Um, number two, it's insanely experiential. So uh, with, your, with, you, with me as example, with a lot of these other examples, companies really want to take the technology and engage their customers with it because consumers have such a huge interest. So if you can think of in those terms, extending your existing business model, integrating it into experiential activities, that, that's a good place to start. Thank you. There's, I, sorry, I wanted to make one sure. more point. There's another company called The Void. Have you guys heard of The Void? They're, they're worth looking at. Um, so it, it's a company that's created like a shared VR experience. They just did an installation at Madame Tussauds in Times Square for Ghostbusters. And what they've done is um, they've taken a tethered headset and put the computer that it runs off of into a backpack. So you as the user wear it. And then there's sensors all over you um, that uh, interact with sensors that are in a large space, like a warehouse and with sensors on your buddies that are there with you. So you're all wearing these headsets, the backpacks, you all have sensors on, and you're all within an area that the experience you're in has been mapped to. So you can see the people standing next to you in VR. Um, you'll see little avatar versions of them. And for the Ghostbusters experience, you are like Ghostbusters in training. They give you um, this you know, laser gun to work with. The backpack becomes the proton pack. And you as a team are fighting ghosts in this um, you know, large space that's been outfitted with haptic feedback. So when a ghost flies by, they have a wind machine that you know, blows wind at you. Um, the floor rumbles. You walk upstairs. And everything is mapped exactly to the space. So whatever you're seeing in the headset is what you're walking on. Um, they charge, I think, $30 a ticket for that experience. Obviously, that takes a huge infrastructure, and it's a very different kind of business model. But I think thinking about these experiences as uh, theme park rides is an interesting way to look at it as well. So someone brought up social media before. And I just hearken back to last year at Mobile World Congress, where that scene where Mark Zuckerberg is walking down, and everybody has a, I think they were all wearing the, uh, uh, the Gear VR on. And obviously, Facebook has a huge investment in it. What is, what is social media going to look like in virtual reality? Are you going to have people as avatars sort of running around the place and talking to each other and communicating with each other, even though they're in different parts of the world? What, what, do, you, what do you think social media is going to be like in virtual reality? Anybody? 
Um, well, sorry, I don't want to dominate the <laughs> microphone, but um, I think it's interesting. Your answers and, are pretty good. You're not. Yeah. Go ahead, Tom. <laughs> um, I think this brings up a whole other part of VR that we haven't talked about, which is live streaming. There's a, a few companies that do this, but um, one that you know I think is uh, maybe the most public facing is Next VR, and they live stream sports events, concerts, uh, you know, all different types of things. And um, you know, I, I could see that live streaming in VR could become a very social experience. Um, it's also another interesting monetization model. If you know, instead of buying a, a concert ticket, you're buying a ticket to a VR experience that you can watch at home. Um, so you know, social in that way, if, if live streaming um, is part of the conversation, it, it could be very interesting. You know, the great thing about having a platform is we have people working on this, uh, these issues, but I don't think anybody's solved it yet. I think there's going to be two types of social. I call it primary and secondary. So the way to think about primary is core social experiences where just looking through a screen is not enough. So pretend virtually I wanted somebody to work with me to fix an engine on a car, except that person's you know, halfway across the world and I'm here. That can be an insanely um, social experience. Um, and even though they may exist as an avatar, and I think there's a whole set of products and technologies where avatars are gonna look more like us versus you know, the little stick figure arrowhead right. people. Right. Um, I think that, that that's going to be, those type of things are what we're going to look for, where there's true value add to the social experience versus what we get today. Then I think there will be a whole world of secondary social experiences. So a quintessential example is um, if you've seen the, uh, for example, uh, um, our uh, Samsung VR video app or the Netflix uh, streaming app. Imagine sitting with your friends in a room, watching the video, talking, um, being able to do things at the, at the same time. Again, what is the value add of that in VR versus being able to be in Facebook itself or having, being in Snapchat and having real-time conversations? I think that's going to be key. So we have like nine minutes left. So I'm going to open it up to the floor for questions. Is there any questions for the panel? If you have a question, just put your hand in the air and I'll come to you at the mic. Thank you. This is a question to Michael. Um, you touched about the hardware piece where it's clunky and uh, it's right now hard to fit. Um, and it's really the experience is about you'll get tired of it using it for more than an hour. So what's the roadmap towards creating a hardware that is not like that? Are you kidding? They don't even tell me the roadmap. <laughs> they never tell the roadmap to people coming out to these social events. Um, so I can't go into detail on the roadmap, but I think if you look at the media, it's extremely safe to say that um, we, we do have issues. We're in a first genera generation hardware situation where um, uh, these it, it's not comfortable to basically wear a super heavy ski goggle or a, um, or a face mask here. So I think uh, one area for innovation is going to be that form factor. Um, and interesting, as you innovate there, is there the possibility over the long term, five to ten years, for AR and VR to converge in that form factor um, where the economics work? Um, I think a, a second area that is absolutely critical is um, is resolution in our hardware. Um, so you have a little bit less of a problem in the games and where there's animation. But uh, I look, I, I work a lot with uh, filmmakers, as I'm sure Mia does. And so um, what you typically see is that experience is fine outside the headset. And then in the headset, um, the users tend to think, whoa, I went back to my pre-HD uh, TV world. So these, there, I won't go into all the technical reasons for that, and those are, th those are known issues. Luckily, the benefits of VR, I believe, in the short term overcome a lot of those issues. But look for those two vectors for future, um, uh, future improvement. Hello, Michael. 
Uh, Samsung did a promotion with the S7 and the VR sometime back earlier in the year. Uh, talk about how that promotion went, uh, because I saw a lot of uplift and uh, talk about that promotion. So uh, from a, a profit stand, a standpoint and awareness standpoint, how successful was that promotion? Well, I, you know, I, I actually don't know the, the the numbers, believe it or not, the, that part of the business is a little bit of a, of a different business. Um, what I will say is, um, and I think these are public numbers, um, literally we went, f you know, we had a million active users um, uh, leading up to um, that promotion. Um, and after, immediately after that promotion, I think uh, our partner Oculus announced a million active users in the headset. So a lot of that was uh, driven um, by um, the promotion of a, of a new piece of hardware and a new headset. And by the way, it's, it's not good enough to give away a headset with a phone if people don't use the headset. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of thought that, that goes into that because we don't want to just give away headsets if people aren't going to use them. And I think we saw really good uh, upleft in terms of people using that based on those Oculus numbers. Hi, guys. <clears throat> um, the, the book, um, Ready Player One, I'm sure some of you guys have read it. Um, Spielberg's making a movie out of it next year, a couple years. But it's it, it's looking at a world where VR is totally integrated into society, from business to school to entertainment. And in talking to people, it seems like there's a, a divide where some people see VR as, that's it's gonna be like another stage in video games. There'll be a people that, that love it, but it will never be widely accepted in other people. And I consider myself one of those that thinks it will be. It, it's kind of like a, there's a, a pre and a post when VR really hit and takes over. And I just wanted to see what you guys thought about that. Um, so I'll start with a story. Uh, I was reading an article today, earlier today. Um, when the Wright brothers first flew their plane, um, it didn't get any coverage day one, didn't get any coverage day two, didn't get any coverage day three. I think it was about eight years later when they finally showed up on the New York Times. That was 1903. By 1950, uh, you could fly from East Coast to West Coast in six hours. So uh, I, I, I personally do think it's going to be that way. Um, but my job is not to sort of predict that. My job is to make it happen by uh, making those experiences come to life. Um, and and uh, the test would be if my mom could sit down and, and like she does on Facebook today, spends a few hours a day on Facebook. Uh, if she were to be able to spend a few hours on, on VR, then, then I think we'll get there. Uh, personally, I strongly believe that's going to happen. Um, you know, some of the technical challenges that Michael talked about, I mean, you, there's already a visible path on the product roadmaps that you'll fix those issues. And, and that's, you know, it's not like, hey, it'd be great if I could do that. I mean, there's a path where you can know that the hardware will get there. There's a path you know that the, it'll be much easier to use. Uh, we'll see what Magic Leap comes up with, but that, that could be another way where uh, uh, VR is experienced, not through like, this thing on your head. So I think it'll get there, um, um, and uh, at least the folks here are, are involved in making it happen. Did anybody else want to chime in on that? Good, all right. Uh, one more question. Who wants to close up the show for us? This is directing to anyone that can take this. Um, you guys talked about content and hardware, but nothing about security. So um, the case where I'm wearing this, and I'm in this great world and doing things, but something happens outside towards me, um, is that going to be a hardware solution to that, or sensors, or content, or somehow bring awareness uh, to that person who is in that 3D world. So has anybody touched about the security aspects of it or have some thoughts about it? Please share. I, I think you're talking about the physical, the physical security of the person while they're, uh, while they're in the headset. 
right? I mean, there's some, you know, there's some basics, right? So they're, they're more directed around health today versus I think what you're talking about, which is security, such as um, we make recommendations that, for example, you're sitting down versus standing up when you're watching VR, um, uh, that you only use it for a certain amount of time, that you're of a certain age and, and so on and so forth. But the reality is we're, again, we're in the early stages of this market. And I think when you see high growth with anything, um, you're gonna you're gonna start to see the standards that need to, we don't even know the standards that we need to have for some of these areas in, in VR and that's probably a really good example where I haven't heard a lot of people uh, talking about physical security other than using common sense well if I'm in my house I should lock my doors you know or, or things things like that I know at Samsung for example when we bring people in an immersive experience it's always in a fairly sealed off area. Um, uh, when it's in public, uh, we uh, like to have uh, somebody around them to guide them. Um, so again, it, we don't view it from a, a security perspective, we just view it from a more of a welfare and, and health perspective. I think we'd be lucky if we have those problems. It'll mean that it, it reached mass adoption. You should start the company that solves that problem. <laughs> That's a great point. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.